You're listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm Rachel Sensenig. I'm Julie Hoke. And I'm Ben White. We're recording on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and I'm not traveling this year, but normally I'd be I'd go to my hometown and then find um, a pub and meet all my high school friends and see how far they've regressed as individuals. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not going to happen tonight, but I'll be thinking about them tonight. How about y'all? Got to make my own food, so that's the plan for this afternoon. I'm going to get into the kitchen with Gwyneth. Normally I just show up at my mom's house with mashed sweet potatoes with seven cloves of garlic in it and that's all i have to do but mm. now we're making the whole feast we are making the whole feast too and um even though everybody's kind of sad about not seeing extended family i'm kind of excited to, to teach my kids how to make all the dishes i have a turkey that someone gave me but it was frozen solid and i didn't have a plan i mean it wasn't enough in advance so it's gonna be uh cooked next week <laughs> i posted that on my uh, facebook if you haven't started thawing your butterball yet you may start now and enjoy thanksgiving next week uh, that's it i did that last year i bought a turkey on like the tuesday uh and uh it was yeah. I think I then ended up going and buying like eight or nine rotisserie chickens from Wegmans. Eight or nine. I remember I shop right. Yeah, no, I seriously. I, I made a whole a pyramid of, of rotisserie chicken. Oh man, that, that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and, and just, so, just so the listening audience knows, a roast chicken is a fine bird to use tomorrow. You don't have to have a fourteen pound, you know, oh, turkey yes. with. G- genetically enhanced breasts, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> so say we all. <laughs> all right. I think rotisserie chickens are better than turkey anyway. Just yes. saying. Here, here. Turkey is the national bird of Pennsylvania, the, the state bird of Pennsylvania, though. <laughs> is it really? Yeah. What was the bird. pheasant? Yeah, I thought it was like, yeah. Uh, I don't know. No, no, this is it. Ben Franklin tried to make the turkey the national bird instead of the bald eagle. It lost. Well, turkey, yeah, but turkeys are so weird looking and they're unique to North America, you know, like, so it's an American thing. I might be a patriot if instead of eagles being around all the time as like the symbol of American dominance, it was a turkey because it's a less militaristic <laughs> animal. Definitely. Yo, one yeah. more thing. You know how they, when, when you see an eagle flying in like a video and it, and it goes like, ah! It's like real powerful. That's not how eagles sound. That's usually a hawk sound because eagles sound really kind of weak and flimsy when they, they're, they're they're much more higher pitched and quieter. They're like kind of like chirpy. The state bird is the ruffed grouse. That oh my came gosh, to I me. totally knew that. I, know, I was going to say said, it. <laughs> after I said pheasant, I was like, that's not right either. It's the rough grouse. But they look like a pheasant. A rough grouse looks like a pheasant. But they're mm-hmm. little, aren't they? Uh, maybe a little littler than a pheasant. They don't have as long a t- tail feathers, but they're kind of in the grass kind of birds. Do you have more thoughts about birds? Email us at resistantrepodcast <laughs> at circleofhope.net. All right, let's get to let's get the show going here. We're going to start with talkback. We've had a few people reply to us and send us emails, and we just want to elevate elevate them and briefly respond. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Love it when you send us your emails, y'all. Thank you. We, that, that we're extending the table of our dialogue, and this is how we're doing it. Our friend Bethany is going to get us started here. She emailed us about our last episode about the dialogue of love, and she was reflecting as she listened about her experience as a Black woman in conversations with people who have privilege, you know, predominantly white people who might think that what they're saying is casual or loving, but... Um, it, it misses her and her experience and how the the notions, the ideas, the norms, the systems that inform the, the conversation from the other person's perspective actually further, she said, support my annihilation mm. um, and how misconstrued it is to say it's a dialogue of love when it misses her and her experience completely. So I just wanted to affirm that heartily, that mm-hmm. that when the experience of love is one-sided, you know, it's not a dialogue of love. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. not what we mean. And um, it really does take listening on both sides 
and respect the dignity of both people to have a dialogue of love. So what do you all, y'all have something to add to that? Yeah, the dialogue of love is this healing force, but it's not just something we can label and say, hey, we're having a dialogue of love now. Get with the dialogue of love. It's happening because I said so. (laughs) And I'm going to keep saying stuff instead of listening and making the dialogue of love happen. (laughs) I think that's really easy. I'm definitely guilty of that. I confess to you here and the internet. That is very easy to do, especially for a white person, because I'm I'm, you know, I want things to be okay. The big, the big challenge for white people mm-hmm. in this kind of racial reckoning that we're working on, it's, it's always been the case for racial reconciliation, that this has been white people's hurdle, if not mountain to climb over. But, you know, everything is not okay. <laughs> you know, it's, there, there, there is harm to be known, to be felt, and you're, our discomfort with it, my discomfort as a white person, you know, I want to rush past that. I want to just say it's okay. And, and, and a lot of things are a lot more okay for me. Not everything. Everyone has a unique experience. But like a lot of things for me, especially in this conversation, I'm learning about the harm done. I don't understand it all. It's mm-hmm. not, it's, it's just so, it is so different from my experience growing up as a white person, particularly a white, a white man, that, you know, we have to suffer together. Love requires suffering. And in this unbalanced conversation that we're having about reckoning an unbalanced system and an unbalanced way of shaping human beings as a society, because we've done that, you know, it's going to require different things and probably more things uh, when you're when you're trying to do some reconciling dialogue of love between a white person and a black person, for example, or any, you know, any kind of power imbalance that we're we're trying to transcend by the love of Jesus. It's not. It's not automatic at all, and it cannot be hurried. And it needs to be said that Jesus demonstrates listening as an essential part of dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, pay attention to who Jesus listens to, the voices that he thinks about. You know, even even paying attention to children, you know, like probably the lowest group of people, and just not even considered in the New Testament, Jesus still listens, cares, and then reserves his harshest words for people that hurt them. You know, that's the dialogue of love that I think Jesus is facilitating. When Jesus says, put, I better to put a millstone around their neck and throw it into the sea, I'm like, dang, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was serious. I, I, I still don't know what to do with that. Yeah, I have to ponder that longer because it's like, oh, man, that's harsh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for uh, sharing that, Bethany and, and Julie, too. I think we had another one, too, right? We did. My friend Kristen wrote to us from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She used to live in Philly, and we planted a cell together years ago on South Street. And she wrote to us saying that she's been catching our live streams and reading our daily prayers and blogs and listening to this podcast. And one thing that has been grounding her and giving her hope and peace is honing in on the fact that white American evangelicalism is just a tiny sliver of global and historical Christianity. And she loves the trans historical blog and has picked up some Julian of Norwich. And she says, y'all have been so important to me during this time, especially during the pandemic. And especially as she tries to kind of find her place and what, what Jesus wants her to do in that very segregated culture in Baton Rouge. And she also mentions Johnny's blog. Shout out to Johnny's blog. <laughs> yes. Um, and she, she's been reading it, and it's been a way to kind of affirm what God is saying to her. She uses it to kind of ask questions and realized in a moment recently that God sees her and is nudging her through Johnny's blog to keep going forward on her path. So thank you, Kristen. You encouraged us with that encouragement. You guys want to say anything about that? Shout out to Spiritual Ancestors Month. Julia Norwich got a shout out. We also had Oscar Romero. We had Harriet Tubman. Mm-hmm. We had C.S. Lewis. Help me out, y'all. Let's get them all. Athanasius uh, of Alexandria. Ignatius mm-hmm. of Loyola. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that all of them? I, we, 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 gave, we gave, oh, I had uh, Howard Thurman in there. Um, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, I mentioned him. We sang, like a song. One more. we sang a song by St. Francis of Assisi, too. Yeah, he's one of our favorite saints. 
Um, there's like, you know, all the holy people. And then there in Circle of Hope, there's like a couple of actual saints. <laughs> you know, that's, not true, also, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. You're holy. You're a saint. I also got to name this too. Rod mentioned people in his life that died that uh, impacted him and his ministry um, and in his life. And so imagining who our ancestors are. People that have influenced us that have died even is a good practice too. Our, our more immediate spiritual ancestors. Yeah, that's Rod White, um, our development pastor for another couple of weeks. Go back and check out his uh, Sunday meeting uh, talk. It's so great from uh, November 15th. And check out all spiritual ancestors month on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's youtube.com slash circle of hope. If you want to talk back to us, just email us at resist and restore podcast at circleofhope.net. We definitely want to hear from you. We're thankful you're listening to our show. It's good to be connected. We want to stay connected. And one way you can do that is by worshiping with us on Sundays. We meet at 5 p.m. at circleofhope.net slash online meeting. You can attend a cell, many of which are still virtual, circleofhope.net slash cells. And you can pray along with us on two different blogs designed for different kinds of people circleofhope.net slash daily prayer for people that are beginning their journey. And for people that are on their way, go to circleofhope.net slash daily prayer deeper. This month, we're entering into the season of Advent where we're waiting for Jesus to be born. It's a, it's a season of preparation and anticipation. And so we're in our own waiting right now in this pandemic, waiting for it to be over. And so it might be in this, a special season to wait for Jesus to be born, our Savior to be born, the one sent for us to save us. Finally, if you like this podcast, give us a positive rating wherever you listen to it. And when I say positive, I mean like five stars, the most <laughs> that will allow. And then also you can share money with us, which will keep this show going, pay our communications director and, and help the whole church keep moving too. circleofhope.net slash sharing is where you can do that. Thanks again for listening. It's Thanksgiving this week, and I seized the opportunity in Thanksgiving to be grateful for things. And in 2020, I especially need to do that because it seems to me like there are a lot of things to lament and there's a lot of things to um, just even complain about and a lot of things that a lot of bad things that happen all the time, it seems like to me. Especially least, in Philadelphia. It, yeah, not, <laughs> not yeah, not least of which is how terrible the Eagles are. So, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot to not be thankful for. But I think this week is a good opportunity for us to sharpen our discipline of gratitude um, and just take the civic holiday warts and all and say, let's extend gratitude and grace. No, I'm not taking the warts. I'm just taking the good stuff. <laughs> Oh yeah, so all that stuff. No, no, we will also we will also deconstruct uh, the the colonizers myth as well. But <laughs> let's be grateful because like, yeah, gratitude we, really works. Yeah, we can still develop the discipline. Yeah. Does it work? Does it does it help us? Does it does it give you more life when you do it? The question "Does it work?" made me think. Oh yeah, no, nothing's really working right now. <laughs> I keep I keep hearing that in what people were saying. I keep feeling that in myself, like nothing's working. You know, our routines, our lives are upended. So what what you mean by does gratitude work? Uh, I guess depends on what your expectation is. But my expectation is instant feeling better automatically just by saying some magic words of thanks. No, it doesn't work. Dang it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't just, you know, fix things or make life, um, sunny. <laughs> um, but I think it does work at our hearts when we practice gratitude. It does help to give us eyes to see what God is doing. And I, I experienced that in my cell last week. We all got on our Zoom call together on Tuesday night and, Everybody was just feeling real heavy. You know, someone said, I got, I got nothing. I can't, I can't even face the day with creativity. You know, like I got, I'm done. I'm done with this. And everybody kind of affirmed that. And then as we went on, so much good happened as we gathered together with Jesus at our center, that by the end of the, of the cell, we took a moment to be still and, and to sort of review in our minds, what happened in our hour and a half together. 
and just to name it, to call out a word or a phrase that we are taking with us. It's essentially this practice of gratitude, this practice of seeing what is right now in the moment. And it was so beautiful. It was like we were gathering this bouquet. I love to, I love <laughs> to grow flowers and make bouquets. It was like we were gathering this bouquet of mm-hmm. God's goodness. So you that- go to your garden and cut up flowers and make bouquets for people? I, I do. Yes. See, this, is, this is super impressive, and you should know that. Not mm-hmm. every, Julie is outstanding. <laughs> no. I'm grateful for her. I can't. I'm. I'm. I'm moved by it. What were you going to say, Rachel? Wait, I wanted to hear the end of Julie's story. So she's making a bouquet in cell. Yeah, of, of gratitude. Of goodness. Yeah. Of God's goodness. Yeah. yeah. And we did it together. That was the other thing. Is that not not one of us had to um, like come up with it or generate it on our own. It was like listening to what moved this person and that person and what this one's taking with them from tonight. It was like, oh yeah, God, God's goodness is with us, and I can see it through this other person. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I find a lot of gratitude in my cell, um, among my cell members too. But I think it starts for me with remembering that I am a created being, that I didn't make myself. I didn't usually, you know, make the food I eat from scratch, or I certainly didn't make the water that I'm drinking. I am really dependent as a creature in the world. And that just helps me um, to kind of release this pressure that I think we're trained to put on ourselves to like make everything work and be responsible for everything and and accomplish all these things. And it, it just, man, it just like relieves me so much to remember like God made me. He made, he pay, he he made the birds. He pays attention to the smallest thing. Of course, I can ask for help in this moment. I can pause and remember that God cares. Um so I I really love the image of the good shepherd and my my cell was going back to this last week in our meeting where when as kind of like a call to gratitude um remembering that like Jesus compares us to like the sheep in his flock and he is like leading us to to the water to the to the food and you know we can learn to follow as creatures and not have to um carry the world on our own shoulders and feel overly responsible for everything that helps me my my friends the tea club wrote a song called Creature. Um, and it has this line from Romans 8 in it. All your creatures long mm. for the new creation where boundaries of death are ever failing. And that song has been in my head all week. Yeah, well, that's why you're thinking about creatures. Oh my gosh, just listen to it. Uh, it it's 30 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like an odyssey adventure check it out but um i like like this the boundaries of death you know are, fa- are are it might be fading or failing i can't remember what the exact language is but like that's what you're i think you're, you're kind of getting at that some too that this longing that we're experiencing in this time of death you know we are all holed up in our in our houses right now separated from people that we love on thanksgiving because people are dying on moss. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to we're trying to stem the tide of death. You know, death is more a part of our life, of especially our communal life than ever in my life. It's more a, a, a presence that is palpable than it has ever been. Even when I worked in the hospital and I was watching people die all the time, that was just my personal experience. This is like a whole. We're do- the whole world is united in death in, in a way, you know, at least in, in, and in combating death. And so the, what gratitude is fighting for me right now um, is that those boundaries of death, they're creeping in on me. I'm feeling closed in. I'm feeling constricted by the lines of death. And I don't feel bad about that. It, it's helpful that this is kind of like a, you know, this crisis that we get to be, you know, I'm, I'm doing my part. 
but I hate it. <laughs> and I hate death. And I feel that hatred more so than ever because it's happening to me in just such a visceral way. Um, and it's happening to everyone. And we're fighting about it. No one agrees enough for how to do it. It sucks. And so what gratitude is doing is just, it's strengthening my arms to push back against those boundaries of death. Like you're saying too, Rachel, that my creatureliness needs uh, my, my gratitude, my, my sense of connection with God who is eternal and is clothing me in immortality needs to push back against that because I am feeling very hemmed in, in a bad way, Clo closed in, um, in a cattle shoot. You know, the good shepherd is sending me to the slaughterhouse, it seems like. And I need to push against that and say, no, the space is wide open. And this these, these boundaries of death are not as like real as they are feeling for me right now. And um, so for me right now, does gratitude work? Heck no. <laughs> you know what's working really well? The boundaries of death. They're really working. <laughs> but I acknowledge that and I look at them occasionally with gratitude. Right now, gratitude is like, a, is like a weapon for me. And I cuss at the darkness with my gratitude. I say, hell no. And so gratitude for me is like coming up with all metaphors, you know, I, I said it was a weapon, I'm fighting it back, but maybe it's also like, I'm grounding my staff in the rocks so I can hold on as the waves wash over me. Um, mm. And so does that feel great? Does it make me happy? Right now, only in tiny little moments occasionally, and we might have time to talk about them, but it does keep me alive. <laughs> it, it like I, I have had enough experience of the power of gratitude and I have enough kind of defiance of death as my as the creature that I am that is longing for a new creation to know that I must give thanks or I will surely be swept away or I will mm. surely just you know get killed or be completely consumed by death. So I think that when we're imagining gratitude. I love Julie's image of the bouquet because you might feel like you're up against it. Yesterday, 2,000 people died in the United States because of COVID-19. And we're entering into another lockdown. It's hard. It's a challenge. And so I look to the, I, I look to the New Testament and see what they can do together. It's the boy with the loaves and the fishes that, that ends up feeding 5,000. It's the little bit that you have, the little morsel that you have, the piece of gratitude that helps assemble the meal. It's not unlike Thanksgiving, where you happen to take what the earth is giving you, even this as we enter the cold season, here's what's left of the harvest. Let's make a meal together with what we have. You know, there's something organic about that. And it doesn't take away all the bad stuff, but it helps us see some light in the darkness. And though this moment in the pandemic is unique, I think that the occasion of the New Testament was dark for a lot of the people there, um, even in their own poverty, even in their own oppression, even in their own marginalization. But the early church still managed to share things in common, still have a livelihood, still do something radical, even under the shadow of empire. And so let's use the next, this, this, this now as an opportunity to just add a flower to the bouquet or maybe add a, add some, you could, I guess cornucopia would be a, a seasonal. Um, what is a cornucopia? <laughs> People it's put a, like it's a horn shaped it. basket. And you put like uh, squash in it and things a like harvest. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you could put flowers in it too. I bet, I bet there have been flowers in a cornucopia. Well, let's fill our cornucopia uh, with things that we're grateful for now. Shall we? Mm. What's something that you can be grateful for? Well, we've been talking about cells and I just, I just have to say it again. I am really grateful that we were, were already organized as a cell church, especially, you know, when we went into quarantine in March, we needed a way to be able to keep meeting with each other and, and relating and connecting and, those groups, for the most part, have really dug in and, and stayed together and taken care of each other in new ways. And it, some have even multiplied. And I'm just so grateful for that, that we didn't have to kind of 
reinvent the church or something, that there was already the spirit of Jesus among us in our cells. And, and I think we're still discovering that every day. What else? I'm grateful for the poets and artists that describe their hope in these evocative ways that allow me to access it for myself. Something about gratitude that makes it work more than not working is to say it out loud or to put it down in words. And those beautiful people that put it down in a way that just gets legs and, and communicates to thousands uh, or even millions, depending upon their acclaim. It, uh, um, yeah, I'm just really grateful that particularly poetry. If a poet is famous, they're good. Seriously, because there's something about like, I'm sure there's like avant-garde people that I, I'm just not that in, into it enough to know, but, but usually if a poet is good, like good enough to like be well known, it's because they're getting at something about the nature of humanity. Mm -hmm. They're getting at something deep. They tell the story of the soul. Um, and that's how you get famous as a poet, because that's the project of poetry. <laughs> so it, it's pretty neat. If you're not into poetry, just read whatever is famous right now or has been famous and give it a chance. And it'll, um, I think it'll speak to you and help you give words to your own gratitude. I'm extreme. I'm, I'm grateful for our community's stamina during this difficult time. I think that they've done a great job enduring this pandemic. I think it's impressive and laudable. Um, and I don't want to dismiss that. So sometimes just getting through is something I'm grateful for. But I have to say, I'm also grateful for technology that we have in this time that can keep us connected. A lot has, can still happen mm -hmm. and progress can happen. And we can connect with each other and the community can have some semblance of of intimacy, even in, even in zoom, you know, there's two, two guys that connected to my cell that only connected during the pandemic. And one of them offered an ask me anything yesterday. So we were peppering him with questions. I think I was the main kind of pepper, pe pepperer of questions. You know, I tend to interrupt you before you're done with your question to ask a follow-up. So it's a little, you know, extra, but Lovely. he said, creaturely. He said, you know, this, 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 this actually has this feeling of intimacy and of connection, you know, and I guess the miracle of this is that we actually used Zoom to build some community. And I'm grateful for that. You know, it's so easy to knock. It's so contempt is so cheap and cynicism costs you nothing. And so you can say social media stinks and Instagram is vanity and Zoom sucks. And it definitely has limitations. But today I'm going to be grateful instead of cynical about the opportunities that we have to connect. And, and hopefully we offer you a gift too, even in this podcast that helps you feel connected as well. I'm grateful for one, one of the first things that came to my mind was just to be able to go outside um, and get out of the, the four walls. I'm thankful for the four walls and roof that I have, but I'm so thankful to be able to go outside. And I was talking about that uh, with my family the other night. And um, it leads me to this other thing I want to mention that we, we were talking about friends of ours who are living in sanctuary right now and have been for years and we participated in like a letter writing campaign to the immigration office uh, to try to help get them the paperwork they need to be granted their freedom, basically. And we were, we were, my kids were recognizing like, oh, as bad as quarantine feels, how much harder would it be to not be able to go outside for threat of, you know, um, arrest? Mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and living in, in fear and restriction like that. So I'm grateful for a community that's mobilizing to act on behalf of our friends to try to help get them their freedom and grateful for the freedom that I have, that we have to be able to go outside without fear of arrest. I want that. I want that for them too. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yo, can we keep this going for a second and like do a lightning round? Like just like, yeah. you know, like can we get like um, the bouquet needs more flowers kind of like let's go. Yeah, let's go lightning round style. What do you got to say, Ben? 
Um, my wife. Uh, we've been together for 22 years this week. Wow. Congratulations. My garden. I cleaned it up and nothing's growing. It's winterized. But that process of you tending put, the like, soil. you put like hay on it? <laughs> straw? Hay? Leaves. Leaves. Okay. I'm grateful for my family too. My Je- my husband Jeff and my kids, they really, they, they, they are a lot of fun and it makes, um, you know, not, a, not every moment is like without conflict, but it has made quarantine bearable to be with them. My kids are super resilient people and I'm grateful for that. I've been blessed with two great daughters. My oldest, my oldest does Zoom school without a complaint and with joy. And my youngest doesn't complain about wearing a mask. She's four years old and she can, she can have it on for a long time and doesn't, doesn't protest. She was climbing a tree in the park yesterday with the mask on and insisting that the mask stay on. And I just, hey, you're doing it. And I, 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 I'm grateful for that too. And I'm also grateful that my the I called the Reading Terminal Market um, last week and managed to reserve some turkey thighs that I'm cooking right now, slow cooking in a machine called a, it's a sous vide water circulator, and they're under under they're vacuum sealed. Um, but here's what I'm grateful for: the line was long at the turkey store, and I had made the order, and the butcher knew me and said, oh, I got your order. Come on up. And then I could leave fast without getting coronavirus. So that was I'm grateful for that. I'm really grateful for my sous vide, too. I'm yeah, gra- too. <laughs> <laughs> You're making quesadillas over there, Ben. <laughs> I make quesadillas. <laughs> Ninety five percent of the time that I make it. I know you do. I think turkey is an underrated quesadilla meat. Mm. I'm a vegetarian. My quesadillas are cheese and tortilla. (laughs) They are salsa shovels. Ben, you're going with the tofurkey. I am grateful for salsa. No, tofurkey yuck. I'm gonna eat mac and cheese. Okay. I'm grateful for the teachers that have held on this long Mm, and get online all day, every day, and corral. Uh, many, many children at once. Um, mm-hmm. I'm so grateful for their perseverance, their patience, their creativity, their energy that they bring to their work every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm grateful for our partners in Circle of Hope. I was, I was thinking on in their Sunday meeting on the chat that just the the depth of dialogue that we're having in this time, I think, is is remarkable and the the way that um the their their faith is in action around our compassion teams and keeping our our you know paying for our buildings and and just really keeping the mission of circle of hope going in this time is they're they're amazing people I posted to my local civic association web uh, Facebook page this morning that I'm really grateful for the leaf vacuum truck that drives around our neighborhood and the guys that drive it. Yo, in the suburbs, guys, you Philadelphia people, we put our leaves just in the gutter in a big pile and they come and they vacuum them up. Wow. So great. (laughs) I mean, I pay for that. Like a lot, <laughs> like like in taxes. Yeah, my taxes are ten times your taxes, Johnny. I'm grateful for taxes because <laughs> without taxes, there's no civilization. And so, you know, not the war tax. We're gonna we're gonna resist that, but local taxes keep the thing going. So, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the Germantown Community Fridge. It is um, a free spot in Germantown that has a fridge and a, and a pantry that the community just keeps stocking and local businesses keep stocking and it is free food for whoever needs it. And it's beautiful. Mm. I am grateful for our corner stores in South Philly. I am so amazed that I can get ingredients for like a really good Italian meal at the corner store. It is amazing. And not just Italian, but all kinds of food. 
And I have relied on them even more in the pandemic. And I'm just that these small business owners have a lot of um, grit to keep on going. Philly has a lot of grit. Go Philly. I'm thankful for Gritty. Yeah. <laughs> and all the memes about him. Riding yes. lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful for laughter too. We laughed so much in one of our trainings this week. I wondered if it was inappropriate, but I, I just think that spirit of joy is um, among us. I'm glad for it. I'm grateful for uh, I'm grateful for this team. We've done a lot of good work together, y'all. And I think it's you know it's not the end of year show, but um, I think you y'all demonstrated resilience and courage too in an extremely challenging year. I think for the whole country and also for Circle of Hope. So it's good to it's good to be linked arm in arm with y'all. Mm. Agreed. Are we done this lightning round? I want to throw something else in here. Now throw another lightning bolt. <laughs> well, no, it's just an acknowledgement. Into the of <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess this is a gratitude a gratitude that um because we follow Jesus in like you, we we can hold the gratitude and the grief and loss together. We don't have to just be like all completely grateful and full of joy in order to have some gratitude. The the um we can put it all on the table together, and I think we kind of have to do that this Thanksgiving. Like there needs to be room for all the feelings on the table because it's it's this is a hard time and we are feeling there is a lot to lament even as we are grateful. And I, you know, I'm just grateful that we, you know, Jesus is, is the suffering servant as well as the, the conquering savior who defeated death. And so he holds those things together and, and we can hold, we can be held all together in him, in, in all that we're feeling right now. That's it. Why don't we end with our, um, Philippians 4 passage that we're focusing on for Advent, which uh, has been used to be that kind of happy, shiny people Christianity, because it starts with rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So if you are rejoicing, you're bad. That's not true. That's not what it means. And we're using it actually as a a means of, of, of focusing on the lament uh, as a means of hope, because Paul says it's Philippians 4, uh, four through, um, let's say nine, um, because it's got the Thanksgiving in there in verse six, but it also says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with Thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And our requests are often in the form of lament. Our requests must come from our hearts of sorrow, um, and not just from a fake sense of calm. Because the and that God's actually going to do something because the peace that transcends understanding that is from the Holy Spirit, which we don't, which we experience at like a deeper level than just our emotional states. You know, we can be, we can be, you know, just woefully upset and still the peace can be present there. I want to, I want to read it, but Johnny and Johnny wants to, you want to make a comment before I read it, Johnny? Yeah, just, just briefly. Um, Paul is writing this letter from prison. Mm -hmm. So there isn't, um, he is writing it from the lowest place. And, yeah. and, and, and I think it's very personal for him. He's drawing out joy in a, in a, in a, in an occasion that's really challenging, you know? And so I think knowing the occasion and the context of the passage is helpful in putting it into our context today. So just keep that in mind. He's suffering right now and he's writing to the Philippians, his beloved Philippians. I think it was probably his favorite church. Isn't that, didn't Lydia plant the Philippian church? The whole, they had a, and they baptized the whole household together in Acts. So that's, that's where it was, yeah. Something intimate's happening here, and he's coming from a place of suffering. That's what I wanted to offer before Ben reads this. Totally. I, I yeah, this, let this be a message to the people imprisoned on Thanksgiving um, in their own homes, those feeling lonely, those feeling separated from their family and, and not not at all content with that or, you know, able to talk themselves into it being a good thing, but doing it anyways, all of you people who are suffering in so many different ways, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Mm. Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'll stop there. Amen. Our last section is called Spiritual Show and Tell. We like to share what is nourishing our souls, in part because we want you to have a discipline of nourishing your soul, seeking out content and disciplines and practices and anything that's going to build you up. Uh, that's what we're for. That's what we really love is people people taking advantage of, of all of the great things that the body has to offer them and uh, even making some themselves. So what's nourishing your souls, pastors? The New York Times crossword puzzle. Nice. I, I was gifted a subscription to the New York Times, which I'm excited about because they have an excellent cooking section too. Um, but I said, let's work on this crossword puzzle. And so we've been working on the Sunday crossword puzzle, and our goal is to finish it by the next Sunday. And it's a team sport. So my wife and I are doing this together. And we can do it on two different devices, too, and we can share answers. And it's fun to use our combined knowledges to come up with one product together. Because there's some things that I am I know something about. Like the, one of the clues was rotating engine part. Three-letter word for rotating engine part. And the answer was cam, and I knew that. Nice. <laughs> and I felt there. Yeah. Is we it cam it, with an M? I need to know this. Camshaft, C A M. I uh, yeah, never would have known that. The camshaft opens and closes the valves, allowing fuel into the engine. Awesome. Uh, and if you do get done with the Sunday crossword puzzle, you you will have achieved something that I have never done. Uh, <laughs> 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 I've never completed a Sunday New York Times. I've probably completed only a couple of the weekday ones. They get harder throughout the week, right? I, I think Sunday is the, the peak. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, the, that's the hardest one. Yeah. Yeah, I might be able to do a Monday or a Tuesday. That's so interesting. But my speed is like the Metro crossword puzzle. Yeah, do, do they still have the Metro, y'all? No one goes anywhere, so we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Hey. Philly, we, Philly Weekly got a reboot, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, but it's it's kind of like a right wing reboot. So that's like an interesting thing that's happening in our town. Oh, interesting. Well, I'm going to say, of course, Grandfather George McDonald. Of course. <laughs> he is my friend. He is my brother. He is my great-great-grandfather. And I refer to him as such to my children to the point that they repeat that Grandfather George McDonald. <laughs> I'm reading to them. I, I read them, just finished reading them, The Princess and the Goblin, and now we're on to The Princess and Curdy. Great stories about faith and adventure. and But... For me, my soul is nourished because I just finished the, the Seaboard Parish, which might be one of his most boring books. You're not <laughs> and really I loved it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he wrote these books about this like country Anglican priest just having a regular life, um, taking care of people, helping them have faith, help them get over their, their crap. And um, it is told... Like it is, it was, it was put out in serial form in a magazine. And, um, for that reason, it's about three times longer than a book ought to be. <laughs> and like I said, I loved it. I, I just loved it. And, and it's because I love him so much. Uh, and there's, you know, he, and it's because it's about, it's about a, a priest or a, 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 he's the, the, the vicar. He's just waxing all the time. There's like five sermons in it. You know, so it's it's like mm -hmm. real soul food um, as far as like the power of Jesus to defeat the the boundaries of death, like I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's done in this. So he's just so matter of fact and kind of eloquent about it. It's like it's like the um, he's like an imaginary person. And he is the character is an imaginary. It's like ideal priest. And uh, that fills me up because I'm. I am a real person priest, so to speak, and uh, not nearly as um, good, but still wanting to be good. 
<laughs> you are good, Ben. You are good. Yes. And, and I'm good and, because I want to, not because I am. <laughs> mm. What a great preacher George McDonald is, too. <sighs> I got to read more of him. No, uh, but again, of- super boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know if I recommend the book, but if you have the stamina, the Seaboard Parish. I'm already well, on to the sequel. I want to piggyback on that because speaking of going on for a long time, um, something that nourished my soul this week is a uh, recording of the song Waymaker. John Wilde's leads um, a choir in singing this worship song and the, the recordings on YouTube. And it is 28 minutes long. One song, 28 minutes. And I loved it because it took me that long to get into a space of real vulnerability and worship before God. And the words are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And it repeats and repeats and repeats. There's a little more to the song too, but I I really appreciated worshiping to that. I miss singing in groups. And this is like a huge conference. There's probably thousands of people there. Just the sound of the choir, the sound of the room full of voices. I just let myself sink into that experience um, before God and it nourished my soul. Mm, Sounds beautiful. Mm. I'm reading a book called Trauma Sensitive Theology by Jennifer Baldwin. And it has really been nourishing my soul um, to help me work through some of my own experiences and also um, hold the experiences of many others. Um, She she talks about the importance of valuing um, our stories, believing the stories of our experiences and the importance of the body in, in those experiences and uh, the resiliency of trauma survivors. And I, I really like that because I think there's a tendency, sometimes um, survivors of trauma are kind of looked at or, or looked at themselves as broken um, in significant ways, um, but this author is is highlighting even through her own experience that there's a deep resiliency there, um, and when we can kind of recognize the truth of that from God, um, we can we can begin to heal. Um, so, been very encouraging and um, nourishing to my soul. Mm. What what well fed people? I, I'm I'm praying that everyone listening also has an opportunity to be fed in your soul, not just your body. Uh, but I do hope you get to eat something off of Thanksgiving. <laughs> that is a that's that doesn't just have to be a, a gluttony fest. Um, uh, I it's a way of of giving thanks too um, to to actually make the special food and experience it a little bit. Um, so even if you're alone, I hope you get something special and get on a, a video call with someone you love. And uh, Johnny hopes that you start playing your Christmas music and- Well, I yes. hope you already started. Well, yes. They, they, I'm glad that they haven't, those that are, are, are correct. And- um, <laughs> When and the turkey is digesting, it's totally acceptable <laughs> to begin. I would agree with that. Listen, wait, wait. Mariah Carey is already happening in our house. Wait, why Mariah Carey? Or just that, you know, just oh, that dumb song that's in every store. She's the queen. You got to do it. Yeah, the day okay. after Halloween is a start. I love it. <laughs> no, oh, man. <laughs> so liberating. Well, happy Thanksgiving, y'all. We love you. And uh, see you next time. We'll be back in two weeks. Bye.